center. So today we will be blessed. You know, that's the second one in the, in the world that we have. Um, so Matt Jane, Matthew Jane, I call him Matt. <laughs> According to that, candidate for the Bachelor of Science in uh, Computer Engineering. Uh, Matthew is another of our unique students with a cumulative average of 3.94 and his major concentration. He's currently interning at Prism Energy in uh, Prism, Massachusetts. And uh, uh, one week after he started, the CEO called me personally to tell me, express his gra her gratitude <laughs> for having Matt be a part of the company. So Matt is currently weighing his many option, uh, options and job opportunities in the months ahead. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Mr. Matthew J. J. to the Dr. John Newton Seminar Series. The title of his presentation is um, USB Charging System for Multi-Speed multi Vehicles. Thank you, Dr. Morley. And unlike Mike, I did not come up with an interesting topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I promise it's not as boring as it sounds. <laughs> so, like Dr. Morley said, my name is Matt Jane. I'm a senior here at the Eastern Pizza Catherine College studying computer engineering. Um, my project name is the uh, USB charging system for multi speed bicycles. Um, over the past couple of years, I've really gotten into uh, mountain biking specifically as a hobby. And uh, one thing as a both a student and a, you know, someone who likes to bicycle is uh, the, the need for um, portable electronics, uh, no matter where you are, whether it's out on a trail, <coughs> miles away from a power supply, um, whether it's right down the road. Um, a lot of people enjoy road biking. Um, but just that, that need I, I saw existed. Um, so I don't know uh, if any of you have gotten around to taking a look at the abstracts that are online, uh, but this information is just uh, pulled straight from the abstract I wrote. Um, so, just start off the question, who here has a cell phone? <laughs> okay. uh, and I know a lot of cell phones, uh, I'm sure some of you can really run off of uh, standard USB chargers. Uh, a lot of those uh, can plug into the laptop, your laptop can charge your cell phones. Uh, some just use a, an adapter for a wall outlet. Um, and so I saw that kind of as a, as a platform uh, that can be used in conjunction with the bicycle. So there's that need for us to stay connected, whether it's for business reasons, social reasons, there's, uh, there's always a constant need uh, in our society today to stay connected with our peers, with our friends, with our uh, colleagues. And uh, there are many forms of alternative energy uh, already available. There's, as Mike mentioned, there's uh, energy from wind and solar and uh, water. Um, but why not the bicycle drivetrain? Uh, it's a source that when you're bicycling, you're constantly turning the pedals at a particular speed, and so that's a, a supply that can be utilized. Um, so like Mike, uh, our products actually were pretty similar, at least in the beginning stages. Um, we both decided to go with uh, DC motor, uh, which he talked about a little bit. And uh, those are, as he said, they're efficient. Uh, it's a good, uh, clean energy source, and it can be used in this application as well as, as what Mike did. Uh, so the next kind of step of that is regulating that voltage and outputting it to a USB charger. Um, and that was kind of the electronic side of my, of my project. Uh, and then finally, the application of this project, uh, it allows for charging of uh, a tablet, a cell phone, whatever electronics you have, uh, even if you're miles from a trailhead, uh, miles from home, out on a, on a road ride, uh, whatever it is, not to mention the exercise. <laughs> so just kind of in beginning to think about my problem a little bit, um, the primary problem I had was you know, how do you harness energy from uh, this readily available and renewable supply? And uh, I already mentioned the DC motor is a, is a good way to do that. Um, uh, as Mike, again, as Mike said, uh, you know, DC motors, they're turned, as they're turned, they produce voltage and uh, current, and that voltage and current can be used to drive other applications. Uh, so the secondary problem was, you know, where do you integrate that motor onto a bicycle? And there's a number of, there are a number of uh, solutions already available, uh, but none of them attack the problem in the way that I would have liked. Uh, a common solution is to uh, run the motor shaft off of uh, the actual bike tire. And the problem you get with that, you get two problems. First is the fact that then you're dependent on speed. So whether you're going five miles an hour or 20 miles an hour, your, your motor's gonna have completely different outputs. Um, Second, 
mountain bikes. Mountain bikes often have really big tires. Uh, sometimes the rims aren't even standard. Uh, so there's problems with using uh, tires across a wide range of bikes uh, for producing energy in this way. And the final piece of the problem is how do you take that output then from the motor and how do you um, regulate it into a way that's compatible with USB chargers? Uh, so beginning to do some research on this problem, um, I looked up some patents that are already out there. Um, so on the screen I have uh, just a few uh, that I found in, in looking. Um, and you can read through some of those yourself. But as I was going through, none of them really attacked the problem the way that I intend, intended to. Um, no, none of them mentioned the actual source of their power. Most of them referenced some kind of a battery pack or, um, you know, uh, you can read it, an uh, electric power unit for a bicycle. Very vague, but they never, they never explicitly mentioned where they're getting that power coming from. Um, and so that's where I come in. I decide. Well, I'd like to use the rear derailleur of a bicycle and the bicycle drivetrain as that supply. Um, also, there's a number of products, not necessarily patents, but there are a number of products that you can buy right now that charge a cell phone um, from either a bicycle or from a battery pack that you can mount on a bicycle. Um, and again, uh, all of those systems either work off a tire or a rim of the bike, um, and again, depending on speed, it's not consistent or predictable. Um, as well as off the hub, which is the uh, internal piece um, on a bicycle. The hub would be located right in here. Um, and these systems, though, as well, are difficult to mount, uh, difficult to regulate, and relatively unpredictable. So kind of formulating my idea. There's two main components to the design that I intended to come up with. Uh, the first stage is power generation. The second is the output regulation. Um, so for the power side, I uh, already mentioned, DC motor. Um, where do I mount it? I mount it on the rear derailleur of the bike. The rear derailleur of the bike, uh, you can see a picture of one right on the screen there. Uh, that's what takes the chain as you're pedaling and it shifts it from gear to gear in the back. And that's why my product is entitled for multi-speed bicycles. Um, that's why that's, that comes into play um, here. Uh, many modern bikes, except for some that are used by commuters commonly, uh, utilize a range of gears in the back. It's easier for riders. Uh, there's a range of speeds that you can come with, but when you mount the motor on the derailleur, no matter what gear you're in, your pedaling cadence is constant. Uh, so the second piece of the project, the output regulation. Um, the first component I intended to use was uh, a 7805 voltage regulator. Uh, it's just a small chip, as you can see on the screen, three pins, uh, an input pin, the input takes an input voltage, whatever you give it. Um, it has to be from 7 to 35 volts. Uh, there's a ground pin and then the output. The output, uh, this particular uh, component, outputs a plus 5 voltage at all times, so long as the input is within that range. And that's, um, that was exactly what I needed for this application. Uh, USB chargers run off uh, positive 5 volts um, along with two other pins, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And then finally, one, one more piece to that. Um, I wanted to use a full wave rectifier. Uh, Mike talked a little bit about diodes and how they work, but there are a number of applications to diodes uh, going beyond just you know, which way current is flowing or whether they emit light or not. Uh, and one of those is a full wave rectifier. A full wave, wave rectifier takes an input voltage and will only keep the positive component of it. Uh, so frequently you see um, with power, power outlets that are found in homes, the actual power that they're outputting is a sine wave. Um, and instead of um, you know, that alternating current, you don't want the negative, you want the positive voltage. And so by using a rectifier, you're only keeping the positive. And that's where that really comes into play with my idea. Um, it'll be keeping a positive voltage whether you're pedaling forward or back pedaling. Uh, so system requirements, those shot statements that Mike talked about a little bit earlier. <laughs> Uh, the system shall mount to an existing multi-speed bicycle system without any structural changes or compromises. This is really important for me because I really wanted a system that I could put on any bicycle. I didn't want it to have to be changed structurally. Um, I want it to be universal or as much so as possible. Uh, second, the design shall produce energy from the gears of the rear derailleur. As those pulleys on the rear derailleur spin, I wanted the motor shaft to spin and uh, therefore create power. 
uh, next the design shall regulate the energy produced to standard USB charging levels. So that's where that voltage regulator I talked about comes into play. Uh, the voltage out that I get output from the motor uh, would be input to the uh, regulator, and then that plus five volts output would be uh, directly supplied to a USB port. Uh, finally, the design shall provide a USB port compatible with any USB charger. And that was also important. I know today there are a wide range of uh, portable electronics that, you know, they all use USB chargers, but you have you know, iPhones, iPads, ta tablets, smartphones, and there's, there's, the list goes on. There's a number of electronic devices that use this charging method. And so if you can create something that's universal, then that's ideal. And the design shall make a copy of one. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> and then off to the right there, uh, some other shall statements that a lot of us are going to see. <laughs> so this diagram right here, this is my initial system architecture. Uh, Mike showed his block diagram a little bit, and this is kind of the, the parallel um, in less fun form. <laughs> so the different pieces of it. First, the installation. I talked about the importance of uh, universal liability um, of the system. Being able to mount uh, the system to any bicycle. Uh, second, the power generation piece. Talked about the DC motor and uh, how that's going to be used as that method of generating power. Uh, the power storage block. That was one that really got modified as I got into the project. Um, the original idea was to have some sort of intermediate uh, power storage between the motor's output and uh, the USB port for charging. And so uh, batteries are the common method of doing this, but by doing so, then there's a whole lot more regulation that has to go into play, so you're not you know, burning out your batteries and having other problems at play there. So that really became outside the scope of my project as I went along, um, but something that you know in the future might be something that can be re-added. Uh, and then finally, the display output piece. For a finished product, this would be a lot more important. You want some sort of uh, display telling you, you know, this is the status of your system. Um, the current power level, things like that. And again, that, that's a little bit out of the range of the scope of this project, but going forward uh, for a marketable product, that would be something that I'd want to add. So system design. Um, this circuit right here on the right, that's actually the final circuit that I used uh, for the prototype. Um, you can see on the left there, close up, that's what an actual full light rectifier looks like. Um, Looks a little bit messy right there, but um, all it's doing is it's taking the voltage, and if it's positive, it keeps it positive. If it's negative, uh, it makes it positive, essentially, in layman's terms. Uh, on the, in the circuit diagram on the right, you see the 7805 regulator and how it's positioned in the circuit. Um, and the other aspect of the circuit that I added later are uh, D1 and D2 there. Those are two uh, what are called Zener diodes, and a little bit of background on Zener diodes. As Mike said, diodes uh, allow current to flow in one direction. Um, but Zener diode will allow current to pass uh, in the backwards, the uh, reverse bias region, um, as long as the voltage across them reaches a certain point. Um, so the way these uh, diodes are set up, once the voltage reaches, uh, I used a 10-volt 10, 10 diode and a 20-volt diode. So once the voltage reaches 30 volts, uh, it will allow current to pass, and so the voltage input to the regulator is clamped at 30 volts. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the maximum input to the regulator is 35 volts, and so that becomes important for not allowing uh, too much voltage to go into that regulator. So just kind of a, an outline for uh, the prototype that I assembled. Uh, I began with initial testing of the individual components. Um, I tested the motor itself, and also the regulator, I tested those both together. Uh, and I, I analyzed those uh, two sets of data using uh, MATLAB. Uh, and then I, as for the assembly itself, I assembled the system in blocks, uh, the two pieces, the bicycle interface, that consisted of the motor and the derailleur system, as well as the portable device interface, so that's the voltage regulation and the USB charging circuit. Uh, and then finally, the last stage is uh, final testing. So these are the results of uh, the initial testing that I did on the DC motor and the voltage regulator. 
uh, use uh, the my, my DAQ uh, data acquisition device, uh, along with lab and software. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But uh, we're going to use that uh, here in the answer a little bit to, to model our signals and, uh, and then MATLAB to display them. Uh, so the first graph right here, up in the upper left hand corner. This was the output I got from the motor when I spun it. I actually used, for this initial testing, I used a cordless drill to spin the motor and to get a voltage up. Uh, what you see there is actually a scaled down version of what I was getting out of the motor. I used a voltage divider, which just consists of two resistors, uh, to scale down the voltage from what it actually was. Uh, so, this, so that first graph shows one fourth of what the, volt, the motor output was. Uh, the second graph shows the output of the regulator that I talked about. So the output of the motor was connected to the input of the regulator, and I was able to measure the output. And uh, recall that the output should be 5 volts, which for the vast majority of the time it was. But you do see spikes and some, some trouble along the line, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the rest of the graphs, this bottom one shows the two plots against each other. Uh, the upper right right there, you can see that's the actual value of the motor, so multiplied by 4. Uh, and that red line there is the 35 volt threshold. That's the maximum input for the regulator. Um, and so you see there are a few places where that voltage jumps above the maximum limit, and that's where we ran into problems. And when you plot the two against each other on this graph after, you can see how those trouble spots line up. So the integration of the system. Uh, as for the construction of the derailleur and motor system, I needed to use a stock rear derailleur. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I can't build my own components. I'm not an expert with uh, machinery. Uh, so I needed to use a stock rear derailleur, uh, drill the holes in it, uh, open them up, and use the motor shaft as an axle for one of the pulleys. Um, the next stage, the USB charging circuit. Uh, I decided I definitely needed the use of the pulley rectifier I wanted to, be, to work whether you were pedaling forward or backwards. Um, Zener diodes, I mentioned before, were used. Um, and then finally, the, the design of uh, the D plus and D minus USB lines. Uh, USB, as I mentioned, that uses plus 5 volts and ground, and also the two data lines in the middle. Um, the way I designed the circuit is to short, um, that is, connect the two middle lines of the USB port. And by doing so, that tells the device that's plugged into it that it can uh, draw more current and it can charge. Uh, from that source. So this is actually a picture of what the motor system ended up looking like. Um, this was potentially the hardest part of the project, um, just because I'm, I may be mechanically inclined, but this is not an easy problem to solve. <laughs> uh, so I actually ended up solving the system kind of like kind of like Mike did, just kind of pulling it together. Uh, I used a little piece of aluminum, aluminum in there. I used some super glue and. Uh, and it went, ended up working out pretty well. Um, and so this is the, the final picture mounted on a bicycle, what it looked like. And the other, the other system, the voltage regulation system, that's what the circuit actually looked like. A uh, little messy from that picture, not as neat and clean as that diagram shows, but that's, that's what it's doing. Uh, those are all the components in there, and, and that's how I tested it. So that's the final prototype. Uh, on the left there, you see a picture of just the system and the bicycle. I had it hooked up in a workstand so I could spin the wheels freely and forwards and backwards and not have any resistance. Uh, and then the board uh, that I hooked up the circuit on, on the bottom. And on the right, that's what it looks like with a cell phone plugged into it. Um, I actually used my own cell phone for most of the charging, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> so I just have one quick video, just 20 seconds long. <coughs> It's a little hard to see from the video, but um, on the phone, this, the message comes up, uh, you know, phone is charging, the little charging icon lit up, um, and uh, you saw the bicycle wheel spinning as I pedaled it, and it worked forwards, backwards, whichever direction it, it went. So that was kind of cool. Alright, 
so actually, actually quantifying the results would be a little bit more helpful. Um, you see that the results, the graphs here look pretty similar to what I got before. Only this time, you notice that there are positive and negative values uh, in the motor. And that's because I was spinning the motor forwards part of the time and backwards part of the time. Um, but notice that the regulator output shown here and also the green down here is always that positive side. And that's, that's what the rectifier does. Um, also, you can see <coughs> on the regulator some downward spikes. And those spikes correspond exactly with where I stopped pedaling to switch directions. Um, and so this, that shows that um, the system works so long as you're pedaling and so long as you don't stop. So just kind of analysis of that, as I already mentioned a little bit. Uh, but as for the motor system, the pulley seems to spin freely, it drives the motor as I intended. Uh, the output voltage was actually lower than I expected, which ended up being a good thing because less regulation was needed. Uh, but the output voltage was approximately 9 to 20 volts. Uh, as for the regulation system, uh, it rectified and regulated the motor output exactly how I intended. Uh, the regulator, as you saw from those graphs, stayed consistently at around plus 5 volts, and that's exactly what's needed for USB charging. Uh, the USB port provided power to the cell phone that I plugged into it, and uh, the corresponding icons lit up and it, it uh, recognized my circuit as a valid charger. Uh, so just some conclusions to draw from that. Um, the system, it, what I did was show that this design is a viable method uh, for obtaining power from a bicycle. Uh, the power generated, it's consistent, it's generally predictable. Um, because a rider usually rides at about 60 to 120 RPMs, um, that's your pedaling cadence, uh, the, the output is relatively consistent. Uh, finally, the design creates an interface that's recognized by mobile phones, uh, at least the ones that I've tested. Um, and that's, that's important because if, you know, if my phones can recognize them, then I'm guessing most of yours can too. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, just a quick, quick word on future work. Um, going forward, uh, I'd like to explore the possibility of patenting this idea. Um, I know this problem has been solved in a number of other ways. Um, but not, like I mentioned, in the, through the method that I proposed. Um, I'd like to at some point rebuild the system, just keeping in mind some of the revisions that I made and, and problems that I ran into. Uh, there are certainly improvements I could have made along the way, um, and perhaps would have been a little bit less patched together. Um, and then ways to improve upon the system itself. Uh, as Mike talked about, he, he could have uh, perhaps implemented a, a better motor uh, more suited to the application, and I think the same applies to me. Uh, whether it's the ear, whether it's um, the voltage that it's spread, that it's uh, spec to the output, um, as well as improving uh, the derailleur and motor system itself. Um, as you saw from the pictures, the motor uh, protrudes a little bit from the derailleur. It's a little bit cumbersome, um, and so practically may not be a good option at this point, um, but certainly could be improved upon. And then finally. Um, in testing, I noticed that uh, the speed at which the, the phones were charging was not high enough to be uh, marketable at this point. Um, a lot of that has to do with the amount of current that my design was able to supply. Um, and that also can come from uh, the type of motor that I was using, uh, as well as even the regulator may not be able to supply sufficient current. Um, and those are things that can uh, be improved upon going forward. But the important thing is that the design has proved that it's a viable method for uh, providing power to a USB port. Mm -hmm. and that's about it. <laughs> Any questions for me? You said it, it wasn't charging fast enough. Was it charging fast <coughs> enough to offset how uh, the phone being on by itself? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, actually, with my phone, I've I had some trouble with battery on my phone. Okay. Uh, so my phone drained that uh, battery very quickly. Uh, it did slow down the rate of discharge, but it wasn't enough to, in my case, positively uh, charge. Uh, there was another phone I tried it with that it, it was able to. Um, break even? Break even, okay. yes. Yeah, certainly break even. But um, that, as I mentioned, uh, going forward, that's, that's uh, certain implementation changes that can be made to uh, improve uh, the rate of charging. Uh, but the, the conversion of the signal into a signal that's appropriate for USB charging was, was done. Mm -hmm. Do you know uh, what the exact current on the regulator was? Or what the maximum rate is? Or? Yeah, um, the max 
next current rating on the regulator was 1F, um, which that's, that should be sufficient, certainly, for USB charging. Um, the USB circuit that I was working with uh, also uh, involved a resistor and diode placed uh, at the end across the voltage pins of the USB port. Um, and certainly designing that differently could have a small effect on that as well. Um, but as you found with your motor, um, I think the motor has a lot to do with it as well in terms of how much current it's able to supply. So at the beginning, <coughs> Started the design, you went up and you use a drill. Yes, that's right. So, how close did you come from? Because that's like completely blind yeah. from that to the final design. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mentioned in the initial testing, I used a cordless drill to spin the, the motor shaft, and in the end, I'm, I'm using an actual person to hold bike. And um, the results were actually pretty close. The drill um, actually was able to spin it much faster than. Um, I realistically was going to get from the bike, which was good because it, it made me think about you know ways to regulate the voltage that in case of a you know present fail safe, um, you don't want to plug your three hundred dollar smartphone into the system and have it blow up. Um, <laughs> but uh, certainly it, uh, it spun it way faster than I needed. The maximum voltage I think I got from uh, the motor in testing on a bicycle was was no more than twenty five to thirty volts, and you know with the drill I was able to get up. 40 to 50 volts. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. so, uh, so that's a good question. Yes, it, the results were lined up perfectly in terms of the system's response. Just with a practical purpose on a bike, you're never going to get it as high as a drill can. Right. Yeah. No questions for Mike? <laughs> for Mike? <Yeah. laughs> I'm still in Michael's mode. <laughs> All right, can you paint the speaker?